third separate time, basically. I, I moved to Iowa <clears throat> at one point, you know, like after college, because I got a job uh, at, a, at a university. And then I left there to move to Seattle. And then I came back for the workshop. And then we eventually ended up here after a few other moves. So yeah, this is my third, my third stop. Wow. Would you ever, have, <laughs> would you ever have predicted that? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but originally from upstate New York. Yeah. Yeah. Pipe okay. This is the name of the town. It's just a weird little town in, you know, kind of Dutchess County. Okay. And did you have like a, a bookish upbringing? Like, have you always been into this? Um, I would say that I was kind of into like, like in, in high school um, and college, I was actually into like a performance a lot. So I would like, I would read, a, I would read a lot and I would, I studied literature and I, you know, like my mom always in, liked reading and, and liked to write. And so that was kind of inspiring to me. But I, I also feel like a lot of the times in, like in high school, I was, I was in all the school plays and I was, you know, I did like, you know, like the comedy stuff and like improv stuff. And so that was kind of that was kind of my creative outlet for a while. And then I, I kind of transitioned more towards like writing fiction because it was, it was just kind of nice, lower anxiety. I could just kind of sit in a room by myself and do it. <laughs> so well, I was going to say, I don't often, I guess I've heard from writers through the years, a lot of, I think the most common crossover is music where, uh, you know, a writer that I interview will have spent time in a band at some point or will play like, a, you know, you know, on the weekends with friends or something. Oh, yeah. But like writers typically are not, stage performers <laughs> no. right <laughs> no, so like not. how did yeah. you how did you like temperamentally you dealt with that okay like you said there was some anxiety well i think that that was kind of when when i eventually stopped kind of like doing that stuff it, it was for that exact reason where i was just like sort of like i was just i would you know i'd have to, like a performance or something you know i'd, I'd be in a, a play or i'd be in a show or you know a student directed show or something and, and i'd be anxious about it <clears throat> for you know like weeks leading up to it, then I'd, you know, perform and it would be exciting. And then, you know, the next day I'd be like a huge come down. And I feel like that was kind of like, it, it eventually transitioned into where like the excitement of the performance was just so much, so overwhelmed by the, like all the anxiety leading up to it, all of the, all of the time, you know, spent kind of just like dreading having to be on stage. So I just eventually stopped doing that. <laughs> And right. So, yeah. No, I can, I can imagine like the joy of performance is actually just like relief that like it's yes. over and you didn't like, you didn't like vomit on stage. <laughs> no, totally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I never did. Yeah. Did you, did you ever write anything that you then performed or that your classmates then performed? Like, were you writing plays and stuff? Yeah, we did. Um, I, I wrote like comedy sketches and then, and then I was in, um, we, we had a class in, in college. It was basically called sitcom and, and, you know, we would, we would get together as a group and you would you'd write like an episodic series, basically. So you'd spend the first like five weeks of the semester kind of pairing up or, or, or you know, grouping up with other people in the class. And then you'd kind of come up with a concept and then you would write an episode every week and perform it at like the kind of like the school bar, basically. What school? Then, wait, what school was this? Uh, this is uh, Bennington College. Oh, OK. Um, right. And so uh, and then. Uh, and then I, we, you know, I did like a one man show class. So that was kind of like, that was kind of like almost like the, the clearest, you know, kind of like, it was just a, a, basically an unreliable narrator monologue performed in front of people. So that was kind of, Oh my closest. God. Yeah. Yeah. I never did any of that. Like I cannot imagine <laughs> like doing a one man show. If you're an anxious temperament, like that's gotta <laughs> yeah, be a lot. It was, right? it was, yeah. It got miserable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But you clearly like, like, but I, you know, I say that, I say that there's like some dissonance between the two pursuits, but there's also something about writing fiction in particular, where you have command of the full cast and you get to sort of, what is it? Ventriloquize? Is that a, is that a verb? You know what I'm saying? Like you sort of yeah. get to pup, play the puppeteer. Uh, I can see the crossover and I can see the appeal of turning to fiction where you get to sort of, you know, I, I think I've argued in the past on the show that there's something performative about writing. It's just introverted and private, but nevertheless <laughs> performative. You're sort of sitting in front of your computer acting it out, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's, that's all of it, you know, is that you, you kind of have the final say of everything too, you know, so you can, you can kind of, you can write the scene how you want the scene to go. And you don't have to worry about, you know, somebody dropping their line or, you know, trying to, to figure out, you know, who says what, when, and, you know, like timing everything. It's like, you're, you're the director, basically. I was, yeah, you know, did you, yeah. But did you get frustrated with, uh, the, the collaborative aspects of 
performance and theater and all that kind of stuff? Like, was that part of the, what drove you to uh, literature? Was it just like, you know, having to compromise and deal with people and see you know, some control? It wasn't even necessarily that I didn't like to compromise. Like it was, it was more that it was just sort of, you know, it's just like any time that you involve more people than one, suddenly there's just like, you know, you have to schedule everything. You have to, to figure everything out every, you know, and then there are still, there are still things that can go wrong that are out of your hands. And so, you know, like it, it wasn't necessarily like, you know, like, like necessarily, uh, you know, that I, that I wanted control of everything as much as like, I just, you know, it's, it's just much easier to deal with, with only my thoughts, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, listen, I have a film degree and I remember making student <laughs> films and that'll, that alone was too much for me. I was just like, ugh, all these people. And then there's these machines you've got to deal with. Like the, like we, we were like, uh, this was the pre-digital age. It was right on the cusp of everything switching to digital. So I was still like loading Bolex cameras and oh, God. that sort of stuff and cutting actual film, you know? And so I don't see the, I never saw the appeal in that. That was not what I was interested in. I was just interested in telling stories. You know, I wasn't yeah. interested in dealing with machines and logistics. Uh, but you mentioned, you, you know, you said your mom was into reading. Uh, I was going to say, I always ask people if they have like a lineage, like, or do you have artists in your family? Do you have some tradition or are you sort of the uh, oddball? Um, I mean, I think like, yeah. So like my mom always, always enjoyed writing, you know, and she still enjoys writing. And so that was kind of like, um, <clears throat> that was always kind of like what I, you know, I was always, you know, there's probably part of like, there's a part of me at a certain point that like wanted to write good stories to like impress my mom for sure, you know, but she would, you know, she, she reads all the time. She's, you know, she's got her book club and she's, she's, you know, writing stories and stuff like that. So yeah. So she's, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of like where I, where I got inspired to just like, you know, write books, right for the page basically. And yeah. Yeah. But does mom, read, does you know. mom read like, does, does she, wait, does mom read drafts of your books as they're like in process or does she only read the finished product? I, I, you know, these days I, I pretty much send her the finished product. When I was like working on short stories, a lot of the times I would send them, you know, to her in college or in, you know, like after college, you know, I'd get feedback from her on stuff, you know? So, yeah. She's yeah, redlining yeah. your stories. Just like. <laughs> just, just tearing, yeah, tearing it apart. Just saying like, where's the interiority? Yeah, was... You know, it's just like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you get to Bennington, you're going through, I mean, that seems like a, I feel like I've talked to a lot of writers from Bennington. That's like a nice cushy place to be a creative young person sort of sorting themselves out. Right. I mean, it's oh, a totally, pretty, yeah. it's a pretty, o pretty open uh, environment. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. No, that's, that, that was the whole appeal basically is, is, you know, kind of like getting out of getting out of the routine, kind of just be able to kind of like design things myself. That was the appeal when I went there. Yeah. And you knew that going in? Yes. Damn, I didn't know anything. Like I didn't, I don't think I heard of Benning. I don't think I heard of Bennington College until I was in college, you know, something like that. You know, I was always late to the game, but you could just go there and design your own curriculum and just kind of make up your own art school, basically. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to put it. Make your own art school. Yeah, it's a, an art school kit as a college. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you're there and that's when you make the turn decisively and you're like, okay, I'm going to try to write books. Yes or no? Yeah. Like, I mean, like, like that's when I start to really like write short stories and, and kind of, you know, like, uh, like, like, so, you know, I was studying literature. I wanted to study basically like creative writing and, you know, I, I like it's cause I enjoyed writing in high school and I enjoyed writing, you know, like, like little plays or little comedy sketches or whenever it was like the creative writing time of year of the high school English class, you know, I was always like, I was down with that. Um, and so, yeah, so I, but I, I kind of like sort of definitely really started focusing more on fiction. Yeah. Like kind of like the second half of college, like I took some fiction writing classes early on and then, and then some theater classes and then kind of moved straight to the fiction stuff. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. And I'm wondering like those early efforts, obviously there was some encouragement. We all get some encouragement along the way, or at least we are deluded enough to continue, you know, but like <laughs> something that, so something that I'm fascinated by is how bad those early efforts are because the common story is like, Oh, you know, I was terrible. I wrote this horrible stuff in you know, in college or I wrote high school poetry. That's so embarrassing. I had to shred it or whatever it is. But the truth, the actual truth is that not everybody's work sucks equally in the early going. <laughs> like I remember, I remember being in film school and like one of my best friend in film school, 
he was making pretty good shit in film school. My stuff was really distinguishingly awful. Uh, as a film student, uh, I feel like that my early writing efforts, like I always had a knack for writing to some extent. But if anybody read what I wrote when I was 19 years old, there's nobody who would have thought like, well, this guy's going to publish one day. Yeah. Uh, like, so maybe there's, maybe I'm patting myself on the back. I've come a long way, <laughs> <At least laughs> I can, you know, write somewhat, somewhat decent stuff. But do you have a sense of where you were in the early going? Like, did you start at a higher station or were you in the same boat as I was? You know, I actually don't know. I, I like, there's a part of me, you know, like, like having this conversation, there's a part of me that wants to go back and, and look at stuff I wrote from then. And then there's also another part of me that would, would rather not do that. Um, and I feel like, you know, it's funny, I just like thinking about this, there was, there was a distinct moment where <clears throat> it was like a, a class that was weirdly named, you know, we had always like, you know, there's like a reading and writing short stories class in college. And then there was this one class that was basically reading and writing short stories, but like half the class was writers and half the class was actors. And the writers would write the short stories and then the actors would read them kind of like selected shorts basically it was like kind of like the model of the class you know and so there was an acting teacher and a writing teacher and, and it's funny because it was such a confusingly like named class i uh, i managed to like place into that class pretty early even though i was even though i was like kind of like you know because because none of the other like you know basically like none of the other like you know like lit seniors or whatever understood what the class was or didn't realize uh you know how it works and so i kind of i kind of ended up kind of like placing into this like higher level writing class, basically, you know, by accident. And I, I think like that was kind of a humbling experience. And then kind of from there, I feel like I, I started to kind of like really bear down a bit, but I, you know, I don't know. I don't think I was like, I think that I, I, like, I felt very confident in my writing at the time. And also but, like, I, you know, maybe almost like embarrassingly confident in what I'm sure was like a, not a very good product is what I would say. <laughs> But maybe that's a bit I've, I've read that, like, it's good to actually have confidence and to overestimate your capabilities, because when you do that, you actually wind up achieving more. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you, oh, yeah. if you come away from a task and you're like, oh, I was terrible, then you're less likely to eventually <laughs> master it. No, totally. So I guess there's some, you know, something positive about, you know, having a little uh, confidence. But I think I was kind of the same way. You know, I don't think I thought to myself this is horseshit when I was making my student <laughs> films. But I, I've told this story before on this show, but I made a, what I thought was a horror film my junior year about this woman who like kidnaps her ex-boyfriend's dog or just something horrible, you know, like convoluted. <laughs> and uh, I played it for like the entire film department and it got like huge laughs and it was like received as a comedy. <laughs> was, like the most humi most humiliating moment of like my, my creative life. And I was like, oh my God. And I think you, sometimes you need to be humbled. Maybe you need to be yeah. like humiliated like that in order to get your shit together because oh, absolutely, I did better the next time around. That's a terrible feeling. It's such <laughs> no, a terrible like feeling a... to intend like one thing and to have your art be received as something entirely different than you intended, you know? And, and yeah, especially in like a class setting where you're just sitting there, like you're just Ugh. like, 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 like it's all happening. Like, I feel like there were, you know, there are those workshops you have where people are just like talking about things and you're like, oh no, like, I just wish I could stop and be like, guys, I'll scrap it. Like, I don't. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's fine. It's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's we fine. can, it's fine. It's I'll do out. Can I get a do over? <laughs> yeah. yeah I... uh, okay. So you get out of Bennington and you've got maybe some short stories on your hard drive. Like what happens next? Uh, I, you know, I started, you know, kind of, so I was, I was living in Chicago briefly. Um, I was still kind of under, like, I still had this idea that like, I could, you know, like try and do like comedy performance and stuff like that, you know, that I wasn't necessarily like interested in like serious theater, but that like comedy was still, uh, could be like an exciting thing to pursue. So I moved to Chicago and I was like, you know, studying like the comedy theaters and, and stuff like that. And. Well, you're then, trying to get into second, were you trying to get into second city? Yeah. You know, trying to like, like IO second city, you know, I was taking classes at IO and then just kind of like going to all the shows and stuff and like, you know, um, so yeah, so I was hoping, you know, that was kind of like the dream. And then, uh, but like, while I was there, it was kind of just like a rough time, you know what I mean? Like trying to find a job. It was like September of like 2008. So it was just a, uh, great recession. economy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> great time. Great time to graduate. Wait, what, you know, what, uh, what improv Olympics is IO, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what you're, 
like, were you in like, were you in league in Chicago at that time with anybody that like ended up on Saturday Night Live or anything like that? Um, it was so like friends of friends. So like, I think like a, like like I left Chicago pretty quickly. I was only there for about like nine or ten months, and then but then oh, okay. friends friends who stuck around, you know, like um, like friends of friends, like like Amy Bryant was like a friend of, of my friend Mark's friends, basically, or <laughs> like you know um, like. That whole, like, so you, you guys know, are like, tight. So you guys are yeah, tight oh, is yeah, what you're yeah. saying. <laughs> no, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but that was brief. You got to Chicago and you quickly figured out like it wasn't happening or what? Yeah, it just wasn't happening. It was just like sort of, you know, it was kind of just like a rough time, you know, and, and then, and then, so I, so I, I left, you know, I did some temping and stuff like that. And I, I eventually kind of just, you know, went home. So I was working part time. Um, and, you know, and that was, it was, I started to write like short humor pieces and, uh, and I like, I was able to like, that was around that, like, you know, like kind of like McSweeney style pieces and stuff like that. So I started kind of like doing that as like a, a writing project. And then I was kind of working, I was grading papers for an online university. Um, and, uh, that was kind of like my part-time job that I was, that I could do from home. So since I could do it from home, I mentioned basically it was just like, I'm going to move home and figure out what to do next. So, um, so I moved back to New York. And yeah, and then eventually got a full-time job with that online university in Iowa. So that's kind of like the first Iowa stop. Okay. So you leave, so you're, you're back at home, you get your shit together and then you go to Iowa to work for this company it's... basically. Okay. And what's that like? I mean, I guess you, you had already had like, you know, a Midwestern tendency with Chicago, but like to go from being a, an upstate New York guy, I'm assuming you had some proximity to the city, right? Could oh, you yeah, take yeah. the train into the... Yeah, so you grew up doing that, and then suddenly you're where in Iowa? Uh, it's a town called Clinton, Iowa. Um, so it's like right on the Mississippi River. So it's like a river town. So yeah, no, I mean, it was a very. It was because you know, <clears throat> you know, it's like you grew up in like, like the Hudson Valley is 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 you know basically like a, a network of small towns, and but they're very northeastern small towns, and like you know, and so it was just kind of like you know, it was definitely a little bit. It was it was interesting to to, to move to the Midwest and, you know, cause yeah, exactly. I was in Chicago and I'm like, well, I've lived in the Midwest, you know what I mean? Like I already know what the right. Midwest is like. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and so, yeah, but I, yeah, but it was, it was a bit different. Yeah. What is, yeah. What I have no, I mean, I grew up in the, the Midwest myself. I'm from Milwaukee and Indianapolis, but I do not know anything about Clinton, Iowa. Uh, yeah, it's just a small town. So it's actually, so that's where I actually, so, I mean, it's, I have very fond feelings about Clinton. It's where I met my wife. So like, huh? I have, uh, you know, so like, but, uh, it's, <clears throat> It was, you know, it's kind of like, like a small river town. Like there's a, I want to say like, it's one of the widest points in the Mississippi river is there. It's like four miles wide at the, at the, uh, at Clinton, but it's a, it's a, you know, it's a strange little town. I think like, you know, there was, um, you know, some, you know, it's like kind of like a classic Midwestern story, like Midwestern river town story, of like some, some factories shut down and it's a, like a little bit, you know, recessed and, you know, it's just, yeah. Got some crystal yeah. math. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that you would know, but you know. No. So you uh you're there for how long? Um God, I was there for about so I was there for a year and then <clears throat> so we we moved to we moved across the river basically um to Illinois. Um you know like after a year. You know so I met I met my wife and and we began dating and then we moved. We moved to Rock Island, Illinois, which is basically like right nearby the Quad Cities. Um, and like right down the, right down the river from Clinton. And so, yeah. And so we were living there for a year and then I, and then I got a job in, um, Seattle. Uh, right okay. Here. So I, I wrote, uh, what's it? I'm oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, before we get to Seattle, I'm curious to know, like, did you ever have any itch to like get, did you get out on the river? If you live on the Mississippi river, like I, uh, <clears throat> I feel like, uh, you know, it's obviously got a big literary history. Like were you out there on a boat or doing uh, anything? Know, I didn't, I, I have not gone on the river enough. So my, my father-in-law is like a commercial fisherman. He, in the, in the eighties, he was like a clammer on the Mississippi river. So he would dive for clams in the Mississippi river and like, and pull yeah. them up and like, yeah. And so, you know, so he has, he has boats and he has, you know, like he, he, he goes out on the river a lot. And so I've been out a few times and it's, you know, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> I don't know. What yeah, can you can you do me? like can you do like the Mark Twain thing? I mean, I feel like I've read there's somebody who did it, you know, <clears> like there are people who try to like recreate that journey, but I want to say it's not as easy as it once was. I wonder uh, what it'd be I like. I know, you know, like part of the whole thing is like I think the 
life on the Mississippi, right? He was like, um, I think it's, it's, you know, it's, it's before all the dams. So that would change everything. Cause I, I know it was like this treacherous thing that you had to be like this ultra skilled, like ferry pilot to navigate the Mississippi. And then okay, with yeah. the dams, everything's much, you know, the water levels are a lot different. So that, uh, the lock and dams so that you don't, you're not like running aground all the time or like having to navigate these weird passages. And, yeah. yeah. Plus it, I think it was a lot more exotic in the 19th century to like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, now it's like, Oh, you went from Minnesota to Louisiana on a river, like, you know, and probably you have the boat, you know, I don't know what kind of, I guess, a what was it? A steamship or whatever he was piloting. It's fairly sophisticated, but not nearly like, what would you have now? I, I guess you'd have a, I mean, if you, I guess some people try to do it in like a canoe or some sort of like raft or something, but um, you then leave, uh, what was it? Rock Island. And you take this job in Seattle. What was the job there? Uh, so I was writing, uh, it's like a, uh, this is like kind of like, it was like my first, my first writing job. And so I was writing for, um, it's like a, you know, product copy for this website called woot.com. It's a deal a day website. <clears throat> and so basically, yeah, it was kind of, it was a, it was a sweet job. Uh, they basically, their whole thing was like, they, you know, they wanted, they sold kind of like, they sold, they sell like budget stuff and, and they, they want, the write-ups to be funny and pretty like self-deprecating. And, and so, you know, so, so that was kind of, so I got a, uh, it was, it was a pretty, it was a pretty neat job. Oh, um, cool. I was able to yeah. get it basically without, yeah. Like I basically only had like a few, I had a few like humor publications online and was able to to score it through that. So that was a, <laughs> it was a good get. Where were you publishing online? These humor pieces? Was it so McSweeney's uh, or? McSweeney's and then, and then a few other little places, you know, like I had, I had um, there was for a little while Barnes and Noble, like on their website would publish humor pieces there. And, um, and so I published with them and, you know, and then there are a few other like little websites here and there. I'm trying to think like, the, like I published uh, a little bit with like the morning news and, um, and then it was a, a website called the bygone bureau. Okay. And then yeah. at, at what point do you start writing the heap, which is your first book, right? I read the heap like years later. So like I, uh, so I finished, so, you know, I was, I was at, in Seattle for a while, <clears throat> eventually decided to apply to grad school and I, you know, I go to Iowa and I finish Iowa and then I start the heap basically. Oh, okay. Okay. So the, I, I thought the heap was maybe like your thesis or something at Iowa, but you were working on what stories there? Just, yeah, short stories pretty much the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think I was, I think like, like, you know, I think like I had a fantasy about eventually figuring out how to, um, eventually like just writing a novel while I was there, you have like all this time, you have all this, you know, like you're in this cool creative community. And then I just like, I could just never, I think that there's, I, you know, some of like some of the workshop anxiety kind of just like, you know, you get into this, it, like it's, it's easier to workshop a short story than it is to workshop a novel. So, you know, you kind of, uh, like it's, it's, it's more of an interesting discussion. And, I, and so I was kind of writing short stories, thinking I'd try and write a collection of short stories and then eventually I write a novel, but then, yeah. And then I, I, I think I was just sort of like working on so many stories that were just sort of like, you know, like a lot of them are like just still on my computer and I don't know what to do with them. And so they're, you know, so I, um, kind of like when I finished my plan was, I was like, I'm going to try and write a novella and I'm going to try and like, I just want to finish it. Like I, you know, I don't really want to like sit with this for too long. I want to write something and be done with it. You know, I want to write something large and I want to finish it. I don't, you know, and so that was kind of like, that was the, and that was how the heap started. So I started writing it and then put it, put it away for a little while. And I, you know, what I, and then kind of figured my way out. Basically. Okay. And so, so yeah. was oh, the yes. heap, a, was the heap an outgrowth of any of the stories that you had written in grad school? Not really. No, you know, I started writing what was going to be the heap, you know, as a short story. And then, you know, I just kind of like, I never workshopped it. I, so I, I started it, but never finished it. And then, you know, and then I, I realized some of the issues I was having with it were because I just like needed more space. Uh, and so, you know, so I started, you know, so I, so then after grad school, I just, you know, my, my original plan was like, I want to write a 30,000 word kind of like sci-fi novella. And then, and then kind of things kept, I kept figuring out that I needed like other things in order to make it all make sense that I needed to add different components and, you know, like uh, put, put some, put it all together and like put, you know, like that there needed to be like multiple narrators that we needed to have like different perspectives on things. And so like, as those kind of, as I realized those sorts of things, I had sort of grew and grew and, and then was a novel. Isn't it funny how you can go to like the Iowa writers workshop, like the esteemed Iowa writers workshop and spend your two or three years there 
writing a bunch of stories that don't end up getting published, but it's still a valuable experience. I mean, it's not the first time I've heard this, like whether it's Iowa or it's another MFA program, but just like a place where you go and you spin your wheels a little bit, but you're, but you're cranking out work and you're learning the trade one way or another. And you're dealing with, like you said, that workshop anxiety and, um, like, do you have fond memories of Iowa? I've heard mixed things. Like some people really loved it. Other people thought it was like a, you know, kind of a nightmare. You know, I, I had, I had a, I like, I enjoyed my time there. I met, you know, I, you, you, I met some great people to like, who, who still can like read my stuff now and like, and you know, and, um, I'm talking about like, I went there in like the eighties or something. It was like a few years ago, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and so I, uh, but, and I had a good time. I do feel like, like kind of like my trajectory was that, you know, I got to the writer's workshop and I, you know, like that. And I, I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to write the stuff that I, that I was always, that I had always been writing, which were kind of like weird, sort of like, you know, like pretty silly short stories, you know, they're, they're pretty like funny, I thought. And, um, kind of like, you know, almost like speculative esque you know, speculative, speculative adjacent <laughs> stories. Um, and so, you know, I, I definitely wrote that stuff there, but there was definitely a feeling of trying to like, you know, you want to write, you know, like hard hitting short stories or, 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 you know, that that was kind of like not hard hitting is the wrong phrase, but I just like, I definitely felt like I bent my style a little bit while I was there. And then I got out and was, and have kind of reverted back to the things I wrote before, but I definitely feel, I definitely feel more purposeful in that, if that makes sense that, you know, like there's sort of like, when you have to, def or not defend, you're not really defending your work in workshop, but when you have to, you know, when you, when you're kind of confronted with people's impressions of your work, it sort of helps you make decisions. It helps you under, like, it helps you feel more passionate about the decisions you want to make, if that makes sense. I don't know, like that, I, that there are decisions, there are things I like to do with writing. There are things I like to do in my writing that like, I maybe didn't totally realize I was doing before before going to the Iowa Writers Workshop. And I feel like, or, or just like, you know, or any sort of like writing class, you know, and then, uh, and kind of coming out of that, I was just, I, I, I definitely have more of a sense of like what I'm doing and doing it more. And so I do it more purposefully if, with, more, with more purpose, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's really interesting because it's inevitable, I think. It's like just as a, as a human matter, that whatever MFA program you're in is going to reflect ultimately the sensibilities of the selection committee like, I don't care how impartial you think of yourself, you know, as trying to be like, you've got your, everybody's got their taste, right? And so I think that, you know, maybe there's like that, uh, like the Raymond Carver school of yeah. fiction or whatever that I've, I've heard that that sort of like predominated at Iowa, if I'm remembering correctly. And I could imagine being somebody who's more speculative or whimsical or, you know, has more of a humor uh, angle to their fiction going into a program where like hyper realist, like heavyweight storytelling about serious stuff could potentially be something that you butt up against. And then you start to bend your fiction in that direction in an effort to maybe get approval in workshop. Like, was that what you're talking about? Like you're trying to sort of like form your work into like that mold? Yeah. And, and maybe just even like, <clears throat> you know, cause I, I not, you know, like I never really wrote like realist fiction while I was there, except for kind of like, you know, like maybe like one semester I, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and was, okay. I'll do a, I'll do a protagonist who's an alcoholic and who, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. whatever. <laughs> yeah. There's these, this, you know, domestic couple, they're just dealing with some shit right now. You know, they're just like, right. Right. It, right. You know? um, but I, I feel like, it was definitely kind of, you know, like trying to think, you know, it's like you start to almost like second guess, you know, maybe second guessing certain choices you're making, thinking, you know, like, oh, is this going to get like, are people just going to say like, that's too silly? Or like, are people going to ask, uh, what are the rules of this world? Are people going to, you know, like, are people going to say like, this isn't grounded enough or something, you know, like, are you going to get that feedback? And so that's in the back of your mind while you're writing and then like, so even if you're writing something maybe like a little speculative, you're thinking about, you know, kind of, you know, how is this going to be received by, by a group of people who like, I, th I think it was like during the, um, during like the introduction, like, I think one of the, one of the professors said, just like, remember, 
like just like when it was like the new student introductions and stuff, you know, one of the professors was like, just remember everyone who's commenting on your work has been thinking for like for several days what they're going to say about it. And so you get a lot of kind of, you know, you get things like, like, like the readers in your workshop are not going to be necessarily like the readers, you know, who just pick up a book to read a book. And so, you know, and so yeah, kind I, of, yeah. I was just going to say, I don't feel like a lot of the people in my, the, my workshop experience barely read anybody else's stuff. Uh, <laughs> like, like the, the point that I'm trying to make is that not everybody is a equal as a, uh, in the role of the, uh, Cr critic, you know what I'm saying? The critiques yeah. are not all made equal. And I think people put different levels of energy into it. And I think it's a certain skill set. I think some people have a real aptitude for creative feedback and other people are just terrible at it. And it's like you know, <laughs> yeah. part of being in a part of being in a workshop environment is knowing how to parse that stuff because otherwise you're just taking bad advice, you know? Yeah, no, exactly. You're going to get about, you're going to get about like, like 80% more feedback that is actually useful. And some of it's just going to be stuff that you're just like, you know, you know, as it's happening, you know, you almost, you're like, as you're hearing it, you're thinking, you know, it's like, I'm just like, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> like, this, right. is, this is not, this is not what I'm trying to do here. Yeah. yeah. And like, there's like a performative aspect to giving feedback. And so yeah. I could sometimes feel like, wow, this person like really doesn't care. And yet they're pretending to. <laughs> Yeah, just to exactly. kind of fulfill, fulfill their like class role or whatever. It's kind of a weird thing, but I, I hope like I would imagine at Iowa, it was maybe more serious because it's a more quote unquote serious program. But, you know, to, to follow this train of thought about, you know, having a certain sensibility that might not mesh in the most perfect way with like the prevailing sensibility of the program, if there is such a thing. I could imagine how like when you're in it, it's a little uncomfortable and you're trying to find your way and you're trying to get through workshops and, you know, keep a sense of yourself. And then I can imagine as you get out of the workshop or you get out of the program and you have some space and some distance from it that you can then swing the other way. And like you said, be more purposeful about kind of being yourself on the page and following your own uh, nose when it comes to the kind of work that you make and the kind of work that you're good at making. Yeah. No, exactly. That's how, it, that's how I feel about, you know, about the stuff that I'm writing now. It's like, I'm not like, you know, there, there are times where, you know, it's like you have two years and I think like, and I do think that this is a thing, you know, with, with all grad schools, like you look at it where it's like, you have two to three years, you're, you know, you know, if, if, if you're lucky, you're in a funded program, you know, everyone around you, like the only expectation is that you write and, you know, maybe teach, uh, and then, you know, it's like, it's the perfect, it seems like the perfect time to maybe like write the book that you're going to eventually publish. And yet I, I'm like, for me personally, like, like the heap wouldn't have ever happened if I like workshopped the first three chapters of it. I don't think, you know, like I don't necessarily like, I don't feel like this, it would have, I think it would have gotten into my head about it in a way that I was able to kind of avoid while I was out, like, you know, just freshly out of the workshop because I just didn't have to like, but it's know, all, it's, but it's interesting. Yeah. yeah but it, it's interesting at the same time to think about how like the heat might not have happened if you didn't have the, the Iowa program yes. to react against. Exactly. Do you know what I'm saying? No, totally. So no, it, I guess it, it all, that, it all worked out. That's yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly right. That I feel like it's like, um, <clears throat> you know, like, yeah, like I don't think I could have written it while I was there, but I also, you know, without, without kind of confronting, you know, without like, like, it's just like, like, it, it was a good time in that, like, I managed to confront a lot about, like, my writing and about well, what are, what are the things I'm good at? Like, what is, what are the things that, like, I value in a story? And kind of, you come out of that, like, kind of like, yeah, more eager than ever <laughs> to, to just, like, you know, to do what you want to do, kind of. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, so you felt like a little constrained by Iowa and, uh, you know, and yet you, know you, that... you feel like you learned a lot from it. Yeah, and I, and I, and I want to, like, you know, I feel like I want to, like, I, I had a good, like, I was, my workshops were, like, supportive, and, and, like, I think, like, a lot of the constraint was in my own head, kind of, you know, that mm -hmm. it was definitely, like, I was, like, some of the constraints were, you know, like, you know, like, second-guessing myself, imagining feedback I might get, that was in, in a lot of ways, like, kind of, like, not the kind of feedback I ended up getting for most of my stories, you know, that I had a lot of, I had a lot of really supportive uh, kind of like classmates and stuff. And, and most, I think most of the people there, like every now and then, I think when you write, 
kind of like this sort of satire or, 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 you know, kind of that doesn't necessarily, you know, that's not super realist or, or whatever. There are, there are certain people that want to, that want to make it a, like a one-to-one -one thing, you know, that they're, they're, they're looking for the character where it's like, what does this character represent? Or like, what is this situation? Like, what's the real life analog to what this character is going through? in the story. And I do feel like for the most part though, like most of the, most of the readers I had in grad school were, were very open to like weird fiction and, you know, like, like fiction that pushed the boundaries even, you know, and so like, yeah, but it was definitely like, I don't think. So there, yeah. Well, I was, well, was going to say, say, there's no like sense of vind vindication, like where uh, you've published a heap and then you're like, see, <laughs> no, everybody, no, no, no. Like, <laughs> all you, all, all of my, everybody who doubted me, you didn't, <laughs> You didn't no. uh, feel a sense of like try like like uh, what's the word for it? You know, vindication. You know, where you sort of want to rub it in in their face. No, not at all, not at all, really. I mean, like I had like you know, I mean like you know, I mean like I feel like I feel like I like the 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 you know like you have I don't know. There there you're always going to come up against people who don't uh, like who aren't the people. Like I think that that's the funny thing about a workshop, right? Is that like like if, if you're in a bookstore, you're going to pick up a book and be like, oh, this isn't my thing. Right. But like you end up in a workshop with like a bunch of people and some of them would be the pe the person who would pick up your book in a bookstore and be like, oh, not for me, which right. is totally like, and yet like they're also expected to, you know, they can't, they can't come into workshop and say like, oh, I don't really like this kind of book. <laughs> you yeah. Know, like, like, yeah. That, that, it's a great point. You should be able to just, you should, in, in a workshop, <laughs> if it's not your thing, you should just be able to pass. You should just be able to pass. <laughs> Right? I mean, honestly, it might be helpful. <laughs> the, well, I, why, but like, what, it's not going to be worth a shit. Like, you're not going to get anything from a critique <laughs> from somebody who's like not into your stuff at all or like doesn't like to read speculative fiction or whatever it is. You know, like, uh, I think that there's a logic to it. But I also feel like you might run into a situation where a lot of people wind up passing. People take advantage of it because they're lazy. Or <laughs> if you think about the mathematics of finding your reader, like the person who would in a bookstore pick up your book and be like, this is my thing. What's the percentage out of a hundred people? Maybe it depends, I guess, on what you're writing. But I mean, I would say for most literary fiction writers, it's like two or three or four people out of a hundred who would wind <laughs> yeah. up oh, being yeah. <laughs> just because ta taste is so specific. There's such a variety. Everybody's got their own little thing, but it's not a, it's not a simple equation. No, exactly. That's a great point. And, and, you know, and, and part of it is like, you know, I feel like I've read a lot of books that, kind of described on paper, I would say, you know, that's not my thing. And then I've read the book and I've really loved it. So like, you know, there is, there is that issue there, like, you know, it's like, so how do you like find that balance between, you know, it's like, you've got, you know, you're in a room of 12 people and some of them just like might not be interested in this kind of book, but then also right. some of them might think that they're not interested in this kind of book and really enjoy it. And then, you know, it's just like, so yeah. Yeah, you know, I say that and like, I think I'm actually, I'm a very, I, I'm an, I feel like I'm an easy audience. Like I'm open to reading just about anything, just about anything. I mean, there's some stuff <laughs> that if I pick it up, it's just not for me. But like, I like to read lots of different things. I find myself liking or seeing the beauty in most books that I read to the point where I sometimes am like, I, I sort of marvel at people who have like very finely attuned like critical sensibility like they like they're very confident in their criticism like this is good this is bad you know like they i don't know i'm I'm sort of like how can anybody feel that certain about their own opinions but uh then i also will sometimes come down on myself and be like well maybe you're just stupid and you just like everything <laughs> like a, you know what i'm saying like, like yeah, maybe yeah. there's like a failure of intelligence because i'm not as discerning as i should be or something you know? <laughs> Yeah, you're just like, oh, this is so cool. <laughs> yeah, really right. yeah. I think I think what I am, I, I'm simp I'm sympathetic to the writer as the creator. I can always feel the the actual person trying to make the art, and I'm always cheering for that person. I think as long as they're operating in good faith, I think that's what it yes. comes down to. It, it's hard for me to read a book that I know somebody put all. I, I know how much work it is to write a book. Yeah. It's not easy. No. Anybody who put themselves through that, I'm I'm here for you. <laughs> you <know>? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so okay, so you get out of Iowa, you write the heap, the heap, 
like tell me, take us on the, the the journey there. Like you, you finished that book, you find an agent. Did you get an agent out of the Iowa experience? Um, so I, I kind of worked with uh, another agent there about it with a collection of short stories, uh, kind of like basically I <clears throat> I, I um, showed them some short stories, kind of been setting them short stories like throughout my time at Iowa, and then you know they they come to the they come to the workshop and. And then I um, eventually, you know, like I signed with them to try and sell a collection of short stories that just didn't sell. And then, um, so then I had, um, you know, I had my draft of the heap and um, they, they weren't interested in working with that. So that I started, you know, I kind of started the process of looking for another agent and I was kind of maybe starting to think about just like putting it on the shelf. And I, and I decided to send it to one more agent who was the agent who took it on basically who I saw on oh. Twitter, based, you know, it was like a friend of mine from the, from the workshop is also a client of his. And then some other, you know, some other people I, I, uh, you know, you know, other writers I like and respect had mentioned that he's, he's cool to work with, you know, because, you know, other clients of his. And so, yeah, he puts me out on Twitter, like looking for some submissions. And so it's like, oh, this guy seems like he might be into, you know, weirder stuff. So, yeah. And this is, this is Kent Wolf, is that right? Kent Wolf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And okay. So, you know, so, so then the heap. Him. Yeah, and that was yeah. Well, okay, but then the he he takes it out and and it obviously finds a publisher. Like, what what did that process look like? So that process. So there was a couple rounds, um, uh, and like you know, so we we went out um, with it. Like he he wanted to make sure since it's kind of a, a different you know novel, he wanted to make sure like he wanted to send it to kind of like. He wanted to do multiple, you know, or, you know, if necessary, multiple rounds of kind of like small submissions of like, you know, like 10 editors at a time, just the people who might be open to that kind of thing. <clears throat> and so we, we sent it out, you know, we sent it out to the first round and, uh, and, you know, everyone, like, it was, it's bizarre because I feel like you come from, you come from submitting short stories where, you know, you like, you work on a short story for eight months, you, you know, put it into submittable you get the email that's like, hey, like, you know, our average response time is like, you know, 19 months from now, like you might hear from us. And then, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, and then eventually you get like a stock rejection and or like maybe or, you know, if you get an acceptance, it's like, you know, like it feels like it's like two years later. And then you you kind of like you get into the world of having an agent and having a novel out and like, you know. It was like, you know, it was like, people are like, I read it this weekend. Like, I really enjoyed it, but it's not for me. <laughs> you know, like, oh, it's like, right. it's a bizarre well, world. Hey, but, but listen, <laughs> listen, that's a credit to your agent. Cause not yeah. every, you know, I feel, I've, I've heard that like, not every agent, you know, when they send something out gets that kind of response, you know, sometimes things just, there's just no response yeah, from no. editors who receive, you know, so it's good. That means that speaks highly of your, uh, of Kent's reputation that people are reading and responding. Yeah, no, no, he's, he's, he's great. And he, so we did another round and actually, so my editor, uh, uh, Nate Landman, he, um, he had like, he was basically, I think he was just starting to take, you know, submissions basically. Cause like, so the heap is actually the first book he was like the editor of, you know, so he was, he was working under another editor at William Morrow. And so, yeah, he read the heap and really enjoyed it. And then, yeah. And then it was kind of, we went from there. Wow. Okay. So where are you when you get that news? Um, I, uh, I'm, I was walking my dog and I like checked oh. my email on my phone. It's one of those things. Like, I feel like, you know, I was like being very neurotic and I was checking my email every five minutes. And then sometimes oh, sure, uh, yeah. I'd say to, you know, I'd, I'd want to, um, you know, I'd say like, it'd be better if I just put this aside, uh, you know, for two hours, I might actually hear something. And then, but it was just like, of course it was just like a random time when I had checked five minutes ago, I checked my email and it was like, Oh, Hey, like, you know, there's an editor interested. He wants to talk to you. And so we had this conversation and then, and then he, um, he was like working on getting the permission to, uh, you know, acquire the book, you know, and they, they wanted to show it to some salespeople and stuff like that to see, you know, what they thought. And then, and then it was, um, it was pretty much in, in good shape. And then, but it was like, this was all happening kind of in like October. And then like, you know, we talked, I think in maybe November, actually, it was like October, or November. And then. So he was finally getting like permission. And then it was the, like the break that everyone takes for publishing for the holidays. So then Dude, like, you don't know, even, so... don't even get me, don't even get me started <laughs> on people in publishing, taking breaks. I mean, I know it's, listen, I know it's also like an underpaid, like, you know, a hellhole in a lot of ways for people trying to work their way up, but like, yeah. 
vacations, the summer holidays, like trying to get in touch with people, like people check out, I feel like a lot. <laughs> Well, yeah, so, so, it, you know, so we eventually came back. So it was like one of those things where it was like, you know, I was like, you know, like, I think it was like the week before Christmas and I'm just like checking my email constantly to be like, oh man, I just would love to get this news and then go home for Christmas. Right. <laughs> I'd be thinking about this, but then, you know, it came back, right. You know, basically like pretty much as soon as, as everyone came back. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, that's good yeah. though. That's actually yeah. good. Cause I, I feel like sometimes when things slow down like that, and the decision process gets long. That's actually ominous. Like in my experience, like the, the yeses tend to happen quickly, you know, and yes. the no's, if, if, if you don't hear anything or things drag on, it can sometimes be bad news, but it's good that it worked out. You must've been yeah. relieved. Oh, so yeah. Hugely relieved. And I think some of it was just because it was his first novel, like acquire his first novel acquisition. So I think like it took maybe, you know, a little bit longer to get everything in order for that. So that was kind of like, that was kind of, you know, like, and again, like, you know, a credit to Kent, who was kind of in my ear a lot during that process being like, don't worry too much about this. As you're, as you well. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. As you're like breathing rapidly into a brown yeah. paper bag and like, <laughs> exactly. you know, trying not to, uh, and then the book goes on to become like a New York times, what editor's choice, right? It has yeah, some yeah. good critical success and like yeah. a nice debut and like, I think it's worth pointing that out just because, you know, I, it just takes one, like it takes one editor to say yes and to no, believe totally. in the project and then it gets out there and, you know, people start reacting to it and it's always good to be reminded of that. You know, it's like books that do well critically and do good sales or both or whatever, oftentimes faced an arduous, uh, you know, sales process. It wasn't like everybody was clapping for it and racing to publish it. No, I think that that's kind of, it's, it's like a thing that I've noticed kind of like, you know, like, um, is like the stories you hear are either the, they're either the stories of like, you know, like, oh, like his agent sent that out and, you know, there were like 30 bidders in the first 10 minutes, you know, like that it hit email right. or, or else, or, and then the other, the other side of the story is the like, you know, like this, this, you know, Nobel, you know, or Pulitzer prize winning novel, you know, was rejected, you know, 600 times before, you know, <laughs> you know, finally found a publisher and now like it's, you know, and like, and I feel well, like it was, it was like, published, it was published posthumously because the <laughs> author was so depressed that he off himself or whatever, you know, oh, Jesus, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, but there's so many, yeah, there's so many stories that are like somewhere in the middle where it's like, yeah, like, you know, like it, it's, it's a series of like one person at a time kind of, you know, like, a, like one agent is like, Hey, I like this, like, let's, let's work on it. And then one editor is like, Hey, I like this, let's work on it. And then like, it's a chain of that, of those events. And then it's still a book in the world. Like, you know what I mean? Nobody, nobody reviewing it is like, ah, I can tell why only one agent went for this novel. Like, you know, or like nobody, you know, like I can tell, no. why, you know, I can tell why this took two rounds. Like nobody knows that stuff. You know, nobody knows the back right. story. Yeah. Everyone just reads it as right. a book. And, 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 and as far as like your friends and family are concerned, it's just like a roaring success. Right. I mean, I feel <laughs> yeah. like the, I feel like the, the, like the, the general, I feel like the general population's understanding of the business of publishing is so far from the reality of it that it's like, it's one of the more disorienting parts of publishing a book is that like, people just assume things about like sales and about what the money's like and about like what the life is like. I'm, yeah, I'm almost like, glad they don't know the truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. You, you, and you're like so excited. You're so excited about the success. Like you get your book out there and, and then like, yeah, somebody's like, somebody's like, so you're going to like quit your job now? And you're like, and, you, and you're just like right back down to like, you're like, no, I can't quit my job. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, right. Yeah. No, not anytime soon. But, uh, Let's get to the thing in the snow yeah. because I mean, you have a book called the heap, which I have to confess. I did. I haven't read yet, but oh, like, I'm yeah. thinking, I'm thinking like the heap, the thing in the snow, they, they I mean, at least in a, at the level of the title, the heap seems to indicate some kind of mysterious heap of something. And then the thing in the snow <laughs> is you're into mysterious things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, mysterious things for sure. Yeah. So, so the thing in the snow, you know, the heap is kind of like, it, it is more of like a sprawling novel and kind of like, you know, I mean, it's not super long necessarily, but like, it's like, there's a lot of characters, there's a lot of POV shifts, there's a lot of like, kind of like lore built into it. And I really did want to, with The Thing in the Snow, I really did want to, like, I wanted to write something that was just very compact. 
and very kind of like, you know, that there's, that there's like basically four characters through the whole novel. There's some few others, but yeah, but it was kind of like a feeling of like, okay, cool. Like, like the, to me, like the heap is like a, a type of book. I really enjoy reading like that kind of like satirical thriller, kind of like, you know, borderline sci-fi. And then the, the thing in the snow is definitely like, kind of just like this, this kind of book that like, I don't know that, that it, it's like, it's just like, you know, it, it feels, it feels like what it's like in my head. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. You know, but I mean, it's like, I was trying to think of like comparisons as I was reading it. I was like, it's sort of like office space meets the X-Files meets like <laughs> Samuel Beckett or something. <laughs> right? I mean, it's like this, good, it's kind of that. like this point. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like a mannered workplace comedy on one level, but it's also got like this sci-fi uh, horror, almost like a horror vibe. Just, I mean, there's just, a, there's some menace in it, you know? And like, as a reader, I'm off balance. I'm like, oh God, you know, like what's Gilroy going to do? Or what's, <laughs> what is this? Is this thing in the snow going to attack? Like, it's almost like Alien, the movie Alien, you know? And you just yeah. don't quite know as you're going. But it's also like a really funny send up of corporate culture, corporate office culture, which yeah. uh, I imagine had to be fun to write. Oh yeah, no, it was, it was really fun to write. Like I was, I mean, that's kind of what, like, I just like really wanted to, you know, like I really wanted to keep all of the drama, like it's like interpersonal drama. Like, you know what I mean? I really wanted, I really wanted to kind of capture that kind of like, uh, there's kind of, kind of the people that you would only interact with if you're required to interact with them for, you know, your job basically. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, so when you, and then like everything is set in some kind of like, like it feels polar to me, like yes. North or South pole, like somewhere very remote, very cold, but not ultimately defined. It's called the Northern Institute. And, you know, you talk about compact, like I, I couldn't help but think of the horror genre, uh, especially the horror genre cinematically where the, the project seems to be especially if you want to get one of these things made is that you keep costs down like production costs down by limiting it to one location yeah so it's like the cabin in the woods you know <laughs> like or, <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know there are a million it's like a haunted house or whatever it is yes. you know you're in kind of you kind of everyone's kind of marooned in one place and that's definitely the the case here where like people can't even go outside it's so cold that like people get what snow blindness or yeah, you know. yeah, they just get like severe disorientation outside of yeah. the snow. Yeah, yeah. But that's not a that's not a thing. I mean, just no. disorient, like visually disoriented. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. It's a, and that was I mean that was like some of it was you know like just trying to I wanted to you know like this this place doesn't you know like not even doesn't exist but like can't exist you know what I mean like this this location and I just really but I really wanted it to be. Yeah, it's kind of, and I think that that's the concept you're talking about with a lot of the horror stuff. Like, it's a place that nobody can leave. You know what I mean? That there's kind of like, you can't, there's no escape from this. Like, if you're there, you're there and you can't, you know, there's no, like, there's no stepping out for fresh air. There's no, you know, like, there's no, you know, getting away from anybody for a minute. Like, you know, going, going home on the weekends or anything. Like, they're just stuck there. It sounds awful. It's just awful. <laughs> <laughs> And, and also like just the, the, the bitter cold and the snow and everything. I, I'm curious, like, I guess growing up in the Hudson Valley, you saw your fair share of snow in the winter and everything. Have you ever spent time in like an extreme northerly or southerly latitude? No, no, not really. No. I mean, like this is, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, New York, Vermont, Iowa, you know, so that's like mostly, you know, it's like, yeah. I haven't actually, you know, it'd be, you know, Probably the de the descriptions of the cold might be a little bit stronger if I never you know stepped foot in you know like uh like Winnipeg or something or or even further north or you know. Uh, but but you've done your time. I mean, though, you've gotten, <laughs> you know what you, you know bleak winter if you live <laughs> yeah, exactly. in upstate. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, how do, so how does this originate? You know, aside from just having like you know some experience with bad weather like do you have like a vision of the northern institute or do you have a character voice or what's the what's the genesis you know i think so like i forget exactly so i actually i wrote like a draft of this that was like 80 pages long um <clears throat> like while i was trying to figure out what to do with the heat forever ago and, and I, it was just like something was wrong with it and i just was like i don't know what i'm gonna do with this thing so <clears throat> so then i 
I, I basically put it aside. But I think at that point, I was just thinking about like, I just like again, I think it was just like 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 the snow was sort of like secondary. You know, the the the, the climate and stuff is stuff that I came up with later after kind of I really wanted to just like I wanted to engineer a place where you know it's a small group of people who are stuck in this place where it's a little unsettling and yet at the same time at the same time like like I, again it was coming out of coming off of like writing the heap i wanted to write something specifically where like the threats were you know that, like the, 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 that there was kind of like not it's not a quiet novel i don't think like i could say that but that it's kind of like yeah like i think you mentioned that it was mannered like i wanted to kind of keep it more like between the characters i really didn't want like you know like it, there's things in the heat there's like a grand conspiracy there's like you know this like this like basically like a syndicate of these like you know evil people doing bad things there's all of these like big twists and turns and stuff and so i really wanted to write something that was just like like people at their job trying to figure out what to do and and specifically like i think like i just i don't know i'm always drawn to like the narrator like the the narrator uh in the book is just kind of like a miserable like overthinking dude and so like that was kind of like i really wanted to like just tap into that voice and just like like almost like it's it's, it's like you know it's like some of my worst overthinking tendencies just like if i let them run wild it would probably be a lot like this person in, you know, right, right, but he's also, but he's also not like the typical protagonist in a in a narrative like this. Usually, I think the more the more obvious choice would be to have the narrator be like the outlier guy who's actually cool and feels like <laughs> this is bogus and sort of you know, kind of like hates the bureaucracy and. Um, you know, wants to break out or whatever, but like this guy, Hart, your narrator, he like is, loves the bureaucracy. Yeah, I was he... going to say, he's like, <laughs> I, I wish I could remember the movie Office Space better, but like the, you know, the guy who's like, mm, yeah, you know, like, you know that guy? He's like <laughs> yeah, the, the stapler. The he's stapler like the manager. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's, oh, no, yeah, yeah, he's no, like, no, that's. Yes, yes, the manager, right. Yeah. Right. That's kind of who Hart is. And yes. he's the guide, you know, for the reader, he's the surrogate that, that's kind of like taking us into this world and leading us through. And I got to say, you know, like, he's not like, he's not like the guy you want to hang with on the weekends. No. Right? <laughs> you know, right? no. He's not like the, the life of the party. He's kind of the guy you want to avoid. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, it's the, like, I always think of him as, as kind of like, you know, it's like, uh, if you have a friend who has uh, a miserable job and like, but the, the stories of their miserable job for you are so entertaining because like, you don't have to live it. <laughs> and then, right. You know, but then like, but like, yeah, it's like, so like, kind of like, it's like, I wanted it to have that feeling of like, you're just like reading about this guy thinking like, I just cannot, like, like, I would not want to be anywhere near this dude. Like I would not yeah. want this dude to be my supervisor under any circumstance. Well, it's so funny to me, the balancing act that you're pulling off in this book, because like I said, there's a sense of of sort of I impending doom. And then there's also these uh, everyday interactions between Hart, who's like the guy we're talking about, the, the narrator of the book and the manager on site at the Northern Institute. And then there's Klein and Gibbs, who are his underlings. And they have these like really, I, again, I'll use the word mannered, but like very funny, like comedic exchanges that like the kind of dialogue that wouldn't feel out of place in like a Wes Anderson movie or I don't know if that's the right comparison, but you know, just that dry humor, you know, and understated, but like very funny. And then there's a character called Gilroy who's sort of, and now I'm going to really reach and show my age, but I don't know if you've <laughs> ever seen the movie real. Have you ever seen the movie real genius? I don't know if you've ever seen that with Val Kilmer oh, from back in the day. Forever ago, but I can't. Okay, well, there's remember. a character named. <laughs> this was for some reason like a huge movie for me as a kid, um, because it was like nerdy smart people being cool, and so like I think in junior <laughs> high I was like, oh, like maybe there's a way forward for me, you know. And it was uh, there was a there was a character in that movie named Laszlo Hollyfeld, who was sort of like this, you know, he had kind of a screw loose, but he was brilliant, you know. This is the real genius all took place at Caltech theoretically, um, so it was all these like you know brainy like physicist people and laszlo hollyfeld i think was sort of like he had sort of like ptsd of some sort and lived in the basement or in some sort of boiler room you know but he was kind of like the 
he was like kind of like a ghostly presence and only certain people saw him. You know, he wasn't somebody who was out and about. You kind of yeah. might catch a glimpse of him. And you didn't quite know where he lived and the whole thing. And Gilroy reminded me of that character because he's kind of similar. You know, he's not oh, yeah. really, he's not part of the, of the group, really. He's not like under Hart's uh, no. supervision. No, not at all. No, no. Yeah. So he's just kind of off in his own. He's like off in his own world, basically, like, you know, conducting experiments, like, you know, in air quotes, kind of experiments, you know, that like, you know, he's just basically trying to feel as cold as possible. <laughs> and to, you know, so, so yeah, and it's just, I don't know. Yeah. So he was actually, you know, in the first, the original draft that I wrote, there was no Gilroy character. And I think that that was like one of the kind of breakthroughs that kind of helped me like figure out the book. It was just like <clears throat> having this like this different voice come in, having this different kind of energy on the page, kind of interrupting the sort of, you know, the, the you know, the, the little like mundane, uh, like exchanges between uh, Hart, Gibbs and Klein kind of, you know, really was like kind of unlocked the project a bit for me. That's interesting. It doesn't, that doesn't surprise me, actually. I kind of, well, I was almost going to ask you about that. Like, it felt like maybe Gilroy, I mean, I'm just thinking of this, like from a writerly perspective, not a readerly perspective, but I could see how that would be a useful character to kind of come in and mix things up a little bit because the relationship between Hart and Klein and Gibbs is so like orderly and structured and, uh, you know, top down, like that hierarchy or whatever. And, you know, you talk about, you know, finding your way to, through the book and like kind of unlocking it with Gilroy. And I, I'll go back to using like the term balancing act to describe like what you're up to when it comes to kind of like running a workplace comedy on one hand, but also this kind of speculative sci-fi, you know, semi-ominous thing in the snow, you know, which is an, exactly what you would think. It's a thing in the snow. And nobody quite knows what it is. And it's, a little, <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's, a, it's a little, it's a, it's a little bit spooky. And I'm wondering, like, as you're kind of trying to find your way through this plot, if, you know, from a balancing perspective, if, if there were earlier drafts of the book that might've tipped in one direction or the other, like, did you ever find yourself writing like really dark and get into a more like horror, like blood and guts kind of narrative? Or did you ever find yourself conversely, going in the direction of like office space and making it more of like, just like a, a comedy. It was definitely, I mean, it, it, earlier drafts <clears throat> and, you know, including the one we like, you know, sent to, to Nate um, were definitely a lot more of the workplace comedy stuff that there was a lot more kind of to do with like what was going on with Hart and Klein and in Gibbs. And, and it was sort of, you know, it was like my editor was like, Hey, I really like this, but also like, like, you know, it's, it's like the, the dream criticism. He's like, I want it to be like weirder and funnier, you know, like you, you always like, I always, you know, you, you send your stuff away and you're always like, you know, worried that like somebody's going to come back and be like, Hey, can we just like make this kind of like, can we like even this out a little bit, make this a little bit more realistic. And so it's like a delight. Can, can, can we get a, can we get a love story going? Can we get a love story going between <laughs> Hart and uh, what is it? Is it Gibbs is the girl? Gibbs, I can't remember yeah. who the, the <laughs> yeah. woman is. Yeah. Gibbs, yeah. You know. So but like, it didn't, yeah, your, like, your editor actually pushed you in the direction yeah, he was of like, being he was weird. Like, let's keep it weirder. You know, let's make it weirder. Let's focus more on like, you know, let's have more going on with the thing in the snow. Let's like keep, let's like kind of unsettle things a little bit. So that was kind of, you know, so we did some rewrites, but yeah. So like kind of like a lot of the creepiness, yeah. Like it was definitely more workplace dynamics early on with definitely, some, you know, some weirdness in there, of course, and some mystery about the thing in the snow. But I feel like that was that was a lot of revisions was making it just, you know, like kind of like getting like upping the creepy factor just a bit, you know, enough that it's not enough that I don't think like you're, you're reading it thinking, you know, like, Oh, is this going to end in like, you know, everyone's dead. But, uh, <laughs> or, you know, like, <laughs> I mean, I'm telling, listen, listen, I, I had the thought, I've got to confess. I had the thought like, wow, this, <laughs> I, I could see Hollywood getting its hands on a story like this and some studio executive being like, you know what? we need the thing to kill everyone or whatever, you know what I'm <laughs> yeah, saying? Exactly, yeah. You know, I could easily see them, but I mean, like, who knows? Maybe they pay you a bunch of money and they get to go nuts and adapt it and whatever. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm any, wondering. Any executives yeah. are listening. I'm open right. to any changes. <laughs> <laughs> what about, uh, what about the, like your, your intake? Like, are you a horror genre fan? Like, do you read horror fiction on a regular I basis? A, I read a little bit of, 
of horror fiction. I, I wouldn't say that I'm, I'm much of a horror head. I can't, like, I just, I mean, part of it is, like, I'm just, like, easily scared. You know what I mean? Like, I couldn't watch The X-Files growing up as a kid, and not, not because, like, I wasn't allowed, but because, like, I just, like, I can't do that stuff. And sometimes I even find, like, I watch horror movies that I'm, like, I know this is bad. Like, I know this is bad, and I'm still, like, I'm still screwed. Like, I'm not going to sleep tonight. Like, I'm watching I'm this the same way. sucks. Yeah, yeah. I'm the same way. I like, and I, you didn't used to be this way, but I'm, it's not even horror for me. It's just violence in general, anything okay, like yeah. upsetting. Like if somebody's, you know, even just like watching the news, you know, like, it's like, I cannot yeah. like, I cannot be in bed, like flipping channels and watch like a mass murder or like the footage from Ukraine or something. And then just yeah. like drift off to sleep. No. And actually, I think that's actually, uh, that's actually good. Right. I mean, like, who are these? <laughs> Who, who are who are these fucking people who watch like The Exorcist and like drift off into like pleasant uh, sleep? Off, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's weird. A saw film, and you know, just like uh, <laughs> take a little nap. Yeah, I've had conversations with friends of mine who can do that. They're like, oh yeah, you know, it's, not, it's just a movie, and I'm like, I know. It's like, <laughs> it's like you have to be pretty numb, I think, to just like watch that stuff passively and not have it affect you. And I think maybe. Uh, having kids, I know you, you have a kid, right? I think it's said in yes. your author bio that yes. that'll change. I think that'll change your ability to take in like blood and guts. At least it did for me. Like it wasn't. Oh yeah, it wasn't as easy to watch that stuff after you have children and you're like, I don't know, maybe I just yeah. got soft. <laughs> uh, so okay, so you've got the thing in the snow out. Book number two, like the sophomore book uh in print with the same publisher that published the heap right yeah yeah same publisher same editor um yeah okay so that's good that's nice yeah, that doesn't no, always great. doesn't always happen that way i should though i want to if it's all right i wouldn't mind giving a shout out to um the harper collins union uh currently yeah. on strike you know still on strike so yeah so my editor and, and a bunch of the people i've a bunch of the people who worked on this book you know like are all part of the harper collins union so i just want to you know, shout them out, support the solidarity. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I feel like, yeah. And I should say, you know, like I feel bad kind of like, uh, for bagging on publishing for taste. <laughs> I just feel like here's the thing. I don't know anything about it. I've never worked in New York at a publishing house. I know <laughs> that these people are grossly underpaid. Yes. Uh, I think the only, the joke that I'm trying to make is like, whenever I send a, a group email out, like it is guaranteed that at least 50% of the people on the group email will be like, I'm out, of, I'm out of the office until like, you know, next week. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It's just a law. It's like a law in publishing. The or maybe they're working from home, but um, certainly I, you know, I feel like, I mean, this is not something for you and I to solve in this conversation, but it does. <laughs> you, you look at like the Harper Collins strike and you read all these like essays by people who are trying to make their way in publishing in these entry level jobs living in New York City. Yeah. And, you know, uh, on wages that are just completely inhuman. And it, what I want to know is that like, you know, publishing for all of its difficulties, you know, for all the difficulties of financially for people who are trying to publish things like literary fiction, um, just trying to sell books in general is tough. It's still like a multi-billion dollar business. Yeah. Uh, there's billions of dollars flowing through publishing. Where is all the money? I guess it's with these conglomerates. Like yeah. who's got the money? <laughs> you know, like, no, exactly. There's billions no. of dollars. There's gotta be money around to pay people. <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. Right. I mean, you know, like, it's like, you know, it's, it's everywhere. You know, that's like a thing. Like, it's like, you know, like, it's like talking to like a, you know, a musician and they're like, I have, you know, 1.8 billion, you know, streams on Spotify. And like, so it's like really rad because I made like 150 bucks off that. Like, you know, and it's just yeah. like, you know, what the, every, the, the money's somewhere. <laughs> it's somewhere. <laughs> I want to, yeah. yeah. maybe that can be your next book. Where's the money? Like, let's find it. The, the money in the, <laughs> in the uh, Swiss bank account. But, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. It's like, uh, it seems, uh, unsustainable and it's like what the, uh, what's the old saying, like gold floats, you know, like it's always somewhere at the top and it's a big mess. I hope they sort yeah. it out. Um, so what about your, uh, like a couple of questions related to sort of your, your creative origins as a performer, uh, and also to the cinematic nature of the thing in the snow. Uh, I'm wondering, like, if you have an interest in pursuing anything in television or film, and if you have any 
like, is there any inkling of wanting to still perform? Like, do you, do you still find time to do that? Or do you have any plans to maybe pick that up again? Not really, you know, every now and then, you know, like, I'll feel like I, you know, it'd be, it'd be fun to, to, you know, do something, you know, to like try out for a play or something, you know, it's like, it'll be like, you know, like I'll be like driving, you know, and I'll be like, oh, you know, that's, I kind of missed that a little bit. And then, uh, you know, by the time I get to where I'm going, I've already kind of forgotten. So like, you know, not really, like, I'm not really that interested in, in trying to do that again. Um, <clears throat> not that I, you know, not that I did it very much before, but yeah. And then. I don't know, in, in terms of like working in television or, or film, like, I don't, you know, I don't know. I do really like, you know, uh, I do really like, like every time I sit down and I try and think about something kind of like as a, like a screenplay or, you know, like, or a, a teleplay or whatever, I do sort of, I feel like I miss like narration and I miss you know, kind of like, I miss getting into a character's head. I miss kind of, you know, like, I miss thinking about certain things that are hard to kind of, to kind of convey in a movie, maybe, in, you know, in a script that's entirely made of dialogue. Like, I think, like, I don't know. I, I saw this, it's one of my favorite movies that I saw forever ago is, is a film called My Winnipeg. And it's like a Guy Madden film. It's like a really bizarre um, <clears throat> kind of like history of like, a fictional version of Winnipeg that like, uh, you know, where he grew up. And it's just like, I always think about that movie a lot where I'm like, oh man, it'd be cool to make something like that. It'd be cool to write a movie that's basically just like, it's more or less like sort of a bizarre kind of like alternate history novel that's, <laughs> that's somehow been turned into a film. But like, I don't know. Person, you know, yeah, like at the end of the day, like I feel like whenever I try, I just like don't really, like I, I, I need to find a way to like trick myself into like thinking it's a novel if I'm gonna. Okay. Well, maybe sometimes play, you yeah. just sell, you write your novels, you write your novels and you sell them to somebody else to adapt, right? <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So are you working on anything new? I mean, I am, a... I, you know, yeah, I have a, I have a thing that I had started a, a while ago. I feel like everything is kind of like the chronology is all off on all my projects, <laughs> you know, where like, it's just like, it's something I started like kind of like during the summer uh, of the pandemic where I would just write like short chapters of a thing, you know, every day where I was just like, okay, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write a chapter that's going to be between like 500 and a thousand words long. <clears throat> and so I've kind of been trying to work that into something more cohesive. So uh, yeah, working on that. Um, it's a, it's another, another weird goofy one. And then, uh, yeah, and that's about it right now. Yeah. Just pretty much trying to put that all together. So that's, you know, stuff is always like that thing where it's like, I like, it, I, I just recently read a book in which the main character was a writer and like, and all of the characters were always telling each other like what their novels were about. And I was just like, oh my God, like, I'm like, this is just like, like, this is like my worst fear <laughs> like, of being like in a situation <laughs> of, of like, you know, just groups of people just like sharing, you know, like that stuff. So I'm always like, I'm always like, I don't know, I'm always like, like I'm, I'm not always, I'm never sure what to like reveal. Cause then it's like, if something doesn't work, then you want to just pretend right. it never happened, you know, like, so that like, sure. It's vague enough. So if somebody listens to this and like a book comes out in five years, you know, they're like, oh, he's probably talking about that one. Yeah. <laughs> or not, or not, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or yeah, it completely, exactly. yeah. or it completely reconstituted itself, but that's okay. <laughs> I've just, you know, sometimes people, sometimes people are on empty and they're just not working on anything. Other people oh, yeah. just roll. It's like kind of uh, like chain smoking, you know, one project into the next. And um, I think it's good to keep busy personally, but I, I also yeah. think there's, there's some wisdom sometimes in like refilling the tank, you know, because uh, oh, totally. otherwise the work that you're doing isn't going to be, it's not going to be very good. So I'm glad to hear you're inspired and I congratulate <laughs> you on the thing in the snow. It's a good one for this time of year. You have to love the publishing schedule for this one. They did, you know, yeah. common sense to publish it in the dead of winter, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, you can live it while you read it. You, know? <laughs> That's right. yeah. you, can, you can read it at work in your miserable job and uh, feel, <laughs> feel a sense of community. <laughs> but um, great to meet you, man. And congratulations uh, on this book. Best of luck on the new one. And uh, good luck, you know, making your way through the Iowa winter. Yeah, thanks, Brad. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. That has been great.